All right. Well, like Ashley said, if you're not awake, you'll be awake after hearing that now. All right. So uh, let's get going this morning. My name's Adam, and it's just good to be together. I'm our lead pastor here. So glad you're here. We'd love to get to know you if I don't know you yet. Um, hey, before we just jump into this uh, this morning, um, next weekend is one that you don't want to miss around here at Hope City. We've got a good friend of mine that I've known for over 10 years. His name's John McCallan or Johnny Mack. He's going to be here teaching uh, next weekend. And uh, man, we've known each other for a while. He's one of the funniest, like most creative and best communicators that, that I know. And he's going to be here with us. And what he's going to share with us is right at the heart of who we are at Hope City. So invite a friend. I promise you it'll be a weekend where you're like, man, that was amazing. So this morning, we are continuing on though in our series that we've been in called All in the Same Boat. We've been going through the book of Romans over the last seven weeks or so now. And uh, what we've looked at is Paul uh, has been writing this letter to these young followers of Jesus in the city of Rome. And uh, Gabe kind of summed up our whole message uh, that we've been in so far last week. He, he put it this way. He said that when we trust Jesus, Jesus gives us a whole new life. And, and with that comes a brand new freedom, right? Like we're no longer slaves to the sin that used to hold us and define us. We've been given a new identity. And with that, we've been given a new charge or a new mission. Uh, we've been given this good news of the gospel of Jesus. And we've been told doesn't, it doesn't just change our lives, uh, but, but we're saved by, gra by grace through faith in Christ so that so that we can go tell other people this good news and share it with everyone around us. And that's the journey that we've been on, here, uh, on around here at Hope City over these last several weeks in this series. We said, man, we want to learn how to be followers of Jesus who are, are, are aligning and realigning our lives with him. And we're inviting others to come along in this journey and do the same. Now, if you're like me, all that sounds really good, right? All that sounds like a great sermon, a great gospel message, but like, here's the reality. The longer you follow, follow Jesus, you'll just find this to be true. There's a tension that comes up, right? There's a tension between what you know is right and true and then the reality of your life. Like it's one thing that, does, to, to read about this good news of Jesus. It's something else to like hear it in a sermon and then walk out of here on Sunday, like all fired up, believing it to be true. But then Monday hits, right? And, and like this stuff about Jesus, it's easier said than done. And you actually have to live it out. Um, if you're a parent, your kids, they don't get out the door on Monday morning the way that you wish that they would for school. And you, you look at your bank account and it's still low and you have to deal with frustrating coworkers again. And your mental health battles, man, they just seem to come back and they get triggered at like all the worst times. And the Razorbacks, they lose a game and you yell some things at the TV that like you probably shouldn't yell, but everybody's looking at you and they're like, we thought you followed Jesus. And you're like, shut up, not during Razorback games, all right? But see, the tension that comes up the longer you follow Jesus is this. The gap between where you currently stand and where you want to be or the life that God has created you for, that gap can feel pretty big at times, can't it? And you can start to feel stuck between where you currently find yourself and what you really want for yourself or, or bigger than that, what God really wants for your life. So growing up, I played a sport like every season. In the fall, it was soccer. In the, women, in the winter, I played basketball, but I sucked at basketball. So I ended up just playing street hockey out in the driveway all winter long. And in the spring, it was baseball and track. And if you talked to me when I was a kid, guess what I would tell you I wanted to do when I grew up? Whatever sport was in season, right? Like whatever sport was in season. I, I actually thought when I was a kid that I could play every sport of every season and be like a multi-sport athlete. See, as kids... When we haven't actually played sports very long, we overestimate our ability, don't we? we? We overestimate our ability. And we actually believe that we can get good enough one day to play at the highest level on the biggest fields and on the biggest stages against the best of the best. Like, be honest right now. Did anyone else shoot free throws in the driveway pretending to be Michael Jordan growing up? Anybody else? Like, that's, that's what we want to do. Now, I, I don't want to crush your dreams because most of you realize this is true, but I, I don't think we have any pro athletes in here, right? And the reality is less than 1% of us will go on to play professional sports. And here's why. Because the longer that we do something, we realize the gap between where we currently are and where we want to be or where we wish we could be, man, it's just huge, isn't it? It's huge. And the more aware we become of our ability in something, we actually become more aware of our inability or our weaknesses or the things we need to work on. It's why so many professional or high-level athletes spend so much time practicing. Like, think about it. Basketball players, they spend hours shooting free throws because the gap between where they are and where they want to be, it's still big. It's why baseball players, they take ground balls. It's why golfers, they perfect the imperfections in their golf swing. It's why runners work on their stride and cyclists work on their cadence. See, the longer that you spend at anything, the more aware you become 
of your own deficiencies and your own inabilities, and the more aware you become of the gap between where you currently are and where you wish you were. You with me? I mean, think about it. We can all feel this tension of being stuck between where we currently are in life and where we want to be. And the longer that we stay at something, the more and more aware we become of how big that gap actually is. You know, maybe for you, it's your career or a relationship or lack of a relationship. Uh, Maybe it's stress or anxiety or mental health, or it's a a hurt habit or hang up that you've been working through. Maybe it's around your purpose or identity, like you feel stuck between where you currently are and where you want to be. And I mean, that can be hard when it comes to your purpose or identity, when when it comes to like who you are as a person. And and the same is true spiritually. And what we're going to look at today is that as followers of Jesus, how do we take steps How do we take steps spiritually to be shaped into the people that we want to be and ultimately who God created us to be? How how can we become unstuck spiritually? I I want to say this. If you're not following Jesus yet, what we're going to talk about today, I believe, is something you wish was actually true of followers of Jesus. That, Like, if followers of Jesus got this right, you may stop looking at us and calling us hypocrites or judgmental or self-righteous, and maybe you'd even give this whole faith thing uh, some consideration, and you may even be willing to lean into it a little bit if we got this right within the church. Uh, today, we're going to be in Romans chapter 7. So if you've got your Bibles or your phones, you can go pull those out and turn there. But in Romans 7, Paul's going to dive headfirst into this tension that we feel. What do we do when we feel stuck in the gap between where we currently are and where we want to be? How do we actually live into this new life of freedom that Jesus wants for us? And, and Paul, what he's going to do uh, in Romans 7, he's going to share that, that just like in other areas of life, the longer you follow Jesus, the, the longer you're going to realize, man, I don't have it together. And, and you're going to realize it's not an arrival, but it's a journey. Following Jesus is a process of constantly aligning and realigning our lives with what God says is right and true and best for us, and continually taking steps from where we currently stand into the life that God has for us. So that's where we're going to pick up today in Romans 7, starting in verse 7. It'll be up here on the screens, or you can follow along on your phones or Bibles with us. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Is God's truth, what God says is right and true and best for us, is it sinful because Paul's going, I sin, I don't follow it. Is it the, is it the law's fault that I sin? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. It reveals sin. For, for I would not have known what coveting was, Paul says, if the, the law had not said, you shall not covet, but sin in me, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every type of coveting. And, and you know what Paul's talking about here. Gabe used this illustration last week. He, he said that when you're a kid and you're given a rule, what's the first thing you naturally want to do? Break the rule, right? If, if you told me, Adam, don't touch that table, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go, boom, touched it, right? See, sin living in us naturally makes us rule breakers. And, and Paul says, apart from the law, if the, if, the, if the law was not there, the rule wasn't there, then sin would be dead because it wouldn't be wrong, right? Paul says that once I lived apart from the law, but when the commandment came, when, when the law came, sin sprang to life and I died because sin leads to death. Now, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought my death for sin, seizing the opportunity opportunity afforded by the commandment, it deceived me. And And through the commandment, it put me to death. So then, Paul says, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and it's good and it's righteous. See, what Paul's leaning into here is the very tension that we feel, right? The very tension that we're looking at today. He's saying that the longer we follow Jesus, the more aware we become of God's holy standard for our lives. And the more aware we become of God's holy standard for our lives, the more we realize, man, I don't measure up. I I got some stuff in my life where I'm not where I want to be yet. I'm not where God wants me to be yet. And in doing this, Paul is pointing back to the law. He's saying, apart from God's law at work in my life, before I actually knew what God wanted for me, I didn't know what sin was because there wasn't a rule to break. I didn't know that it was a thing. In fact, Paul would say before he started following Jesus, he would say, man, I'm I'm a pretty good person. Like, like, I do a pretty good job of following all the rules and doing all the right things. Like, I'm a good man. But then he came face to face with God's righteousness in Jesus, and he started to realize something. Man, I just don't measure up. I don't measure up. See, apart from a standard, there can be no rule breaking, right? Like, where there is no rule, you cannot break that rule. Uh, think about it this way. I've always wanted to drive on the Autobahn in Germany. Anybody else, like, wish you could go drive on the Autobahn in Germany? Yeah. Uh, because there's no speed limit, Right? And you can go as fast as you want to, and you don't get in trouble. You won't get pulled over. You can just fly. Now, if you try to apply that same standard of no speed limit in, say, Johnson, right? What's going to happen? 
You're going to get pulled over, right? Like just come to one of our Friday night parties and watch. The police have a welcoming committee for everyone driving too fast coming into Johnson. And see, Paul's saying the same is true in our spiritual lives. When I'm aware that there's a standard in, in my life and for my life, I start to see that my life isn't in alignment. And then I become what? When my life isn't in alignment with the standard, then I become a lawbreaker. And, and Paul continues on, and he, and he tells us that that's the purpose of God's word. It's to set the standard for what's actually right and true and best in this life and for us. In Romans chapter 7, verse 13, Paul says, did that which is good, the law, did it, did it become death to me? No, it didn't kill me. Nevertheless, in order that sin may be what? Recognized as sin, right? That it may be recognized. It, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, through the law, sin may become utterly sinful. So let me say it this way. If I get pulled over, did I get a speeding ticket because the speed limit is 25? No, right? Like I get a speeding ticket when I'm driving 40 in a 25. Like that, that's why, because of, of my own stuff. See, Paul is saying the purpose of the law is not to cause you to sin. The law is to, to reveal the standard. It actually serves kind of like a mirror to set the standard so that sin may be recognized as sin. I mean, think about, think about this analogy of a mirror. What, what is the purpose of a mirror? You just look in it and it shows what is, right? It, it doesn't show what should be or what you want to be. It shows what is. If I wake up in the morning first thing and I look in the mirror, and some of us, when we wake up and look in the mirror first thing, it's pretty scary, right? But what, what do I see when I first wake up in the morning? Like hair everywhere, all the flaws and imperfections exposed. And let's be honest, the mirror just tells me, Adam, you should probably take a shower this morning before you head out the door. And, and what Paul is saying here is that the same thing's true of God's word in our lives. It, it forms a true north. Or, or it forms a standard for what God wants for us. It, it simply serves as a mirror into our pride. It, it exposes our insecurities. It, it shows our lust or our greed or our envy or our deceit. It simply exposes what's already there. Now think about a mirror. Here's what's true of a mirror. It can't change anything about you, can it? A mirror cannot change a single thing about you. It, it can simply reflect what is. See, a mirror actually reveals the very tension that we're looking at today. A mirror just shows the gap between where you currently are and where you want to be in life, and it's pretty big. And Paul is saying that that's the same in God's word. It simply exposes what is. It's not the law's job to change anything. It's just to reveal what's already going on. And when we realize what's going on, when we look into the mirror, we have a couple options, right? Like the first option is we can do nothing, right? Right? You can look in the mirror and do nothing. You can look at yourselves and not change a thing. And you can go, man, I don't desire anything. I don't want to do anything right now. And when we do nothing, what changes in our lives? Nothing, right? Or we can try to cover it up. We can try to cover it up. Man, some of us, we've spent years and years and years trying to cover up all the faults and flaws and imperfections in our lives, haven't we? Spiritually, we've put on the makeup. Or we wear a mask whenever we step into church and we fix the messy hair. We've given ourselves the equivalent of like a spiritual comb over, right? Like, and everybody sees it. It doesn't actually cover the baldness spiritually. Covering it up doesn't mean that it's not actually there. It just means that we've gotten really good at hiding it. I mean, for a whole lot of us, that describes our church experience up to this point perfectly. So we become experts at hiding the imperfections and the flaws and trying to live up to an impossible standard that we can't get to. And in doing so, we've been lying to ourselves and everyone around us for years. But Paul's not going to leave us there. He's going to go, man, there's actually a third option. We can admit it and we can confess that we don't have it all together. In fact, that's what Paul's going to do next in Romans 7 verse 15. In the very next breath, he's going to say, man, I don't understand what I do. For, for what I want to do, I don't do, and what I hate is what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, that the law sets a standard I wish that I could live up to, but I don't do it. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it, it is what? It's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out on my own, Paul would say. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. Anybody ever felt that? You ever felt that in your life? For, um, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is what? The sin living in me that does it. I mean, we feel that tension, don't we? 
Like, like we live in that tension every day. I do not do the good that I want to do, but the things I don't want to do, man, that's what I keep on doing. See, the longer we follow Jesus, we have to come to a place where we realize and we admit, man, I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived and I, I can't cover it up. And we have to realize that this tension is, is playing out and the gap between where we currently are and what we want for ourselves is really, really big. And, and, and what God wants for us, man, we're, we're a long way off from that. And, and sometimes spiritually, we can just feel stuck, right? We just feel stuck and we can go, man, the, the good that I want to do, I can't do it. And where I want to be and what I want to do, man, I, I don't know how to get there. In fact, it can often feel like those old cartoons, you know what I'm talking about, where you've got an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, and they're both like speaking into your ears, and one's telling you that you should do one thing, and the other's telling you you should do something else. And man, our spiritual lives, it can feel like a tug of war match, can't it? It can feel like you're getting pulled back and forth, and you are the rope being used in tug of war. Uh, so the best way that I've seen this tension illustrated to help us get our heads and our hearts around this is through an exercise that I've done on like a men's retreat uh, weekend. And I, I've told you before that this weekend, it, it's like fight club, all right? Like you don't talk about fight club, but what I want to share with you from this weekend, the, the weekends are called liminal or crucible weekends. What I want to share with you is an exercise to help us understand this tension that we find ourselves living in. Uh, and so I want to invite Kevin and uh, my dad to come on up here to, to help me demonstrate this. Um, Hang on to this for me for a minute. And you can hang on to this, Kevin. Thank you. Give these guys a hand. Thanks for coming up to help me out. So the first question I have to look at when I'm stuck and I'm looking in in a mirror, right, is like, what do I actually want for myself? Like, like that's a good question, right? Like, when you look in the mirror or you look in God's law, what is it that you want for you? Or, Or what does God want for yourself or for you? And see, this is true. Behind every area of life where we just feel stuck, behind every hurt or habit, or hang up that you can't seem to break. Behind every sin is actually the image of God. And and so it means that every sin, behind every sin, there's almost always a good desire. Think about it. For me, for lust, there's a really good desire of connection with another person. Behind pride is my search for identity or purpose or significance. And behind my anger, anger is just an emotion that you express when you're blocked from what you really want. You with me? When you can't get what you want, that's when anger starts to come out. And so what, where I feel stuck in life is this. I keep blowing up on my kids. I get angry at them when they don't do what I want them to do. So what is it that I really want for myself when I look at that? I want peace, right? Like I really want peace. And so I have to look into the mirror and not at them and blame them. I have to look into the mirror and go, what is it about me that is keeping me from getting the peace that I want for myself? And we all have messages that play through our heads in these moments, right? We all have like that little devil and angel on our shoulders that are playing, playing this out. And, and, and I hear messages like this on a negative side. It goes like this. Your kids don't respect you. They'll mess it up. You're a bad dad. And so guess what I do? I blow up on them and I try to prove that those things aren't true. So to, just to illustrate this tension, Kevin, I'm going to have you run those messages and just play this out. Your kids don't respect you. They'll mess it up. You're a bad dad. You feel that? You guys ever felt that way before? You feel that tension? On the other side, there's messages that are telling me, man, Adam, go for it. Go for the peace that you're looking for. And and these messages go like this. Kindness and gentleness will lead to respect. Or Adam, you can't change them. Only God can change them. And so rest in God's grace. And so these messages go like this. Kindness and gentleness will lead to respect. You can't change them. Only God will. Rest in God's grace. All right, so we're going to play these both at the same time, because if you're like me, these messages don't happen in isolation. They happen at the same time, and they're playing out like tug of war back and forth. Your kids don't respect you. Kindness and gentleness will lead to respect. They'll mess it up. Only God can change them. You're a bad dad. Rest in God's grace. You feel that? Have you ever felt that tension before, where you're getting pulled back and forth from one side to the other? Thank you, guys. You guys can have a seat. Give it up for these guys. So, man, I have to ask myself, what's at risk for me if I let go of the anger and these messages over here and actually start to step into the peace that I want for myself? What's at risk? Because if nothing was at risk, I would have let go of these negative messages a long time ago, and I would have actually rested in God's grace. You know know what's at risk? My kids may not become who I want them to be. Like, I have to admit, I don't have control over my kids and their lives as much as I'd like to think that I do. The anger I lean into is actually contributing to chaos in my home. But God's grace could actually lead to the peace that I'm I'm looking for. 
Have you ever felt tension around things like that in life? And so the question comes up, man, how do we practically step out of this tension that we find ourselves in? And how do we actually start to work through it? How how do we take steps spiritually when we feel stuck in this dilemma between where we currently are and what we want for ourselves or where God wants us to be? Well, well, throughout scripture, God gives us some practical gifts to help us us live this out. The first one goes like this. He gives us his spirit living in us. Whenever we place our faith in Jesus, we don't have to try to do it alone anymore. We don't have to provide the power to be good enough. Jesus has paid the price on the cross. And so God gives us his his spirit to empower us to live into the life that God created us for. But there's still this tension, right? There's still this tension playing out. And, And Paul describes this in Galatians chapter five, verses 17 and 18. Paul says that the flesh, our sinful nature, it desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. And so there's constantly this battle being fought. There's a war being fought inside us. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like this battle for for who we are is being waged. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The, The spirit can lead you into a new way of life. And the rules, the mirror that you see where you go, man, I can't live up to that. You can just rest in the grace that God saved you and he's got you. See, Paul's saying that this battle, it's it's gonna constantly go on between our flesh and the sinful things and the things that the Holy Spirit of God desires for us. And then he continues on with how we fight this battle. He says that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. You can hit that next slide. They've crucified the, the, the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us learn to keep in step with the Spirit. So the way that we deal with the things in our lives when we look in the mirror, it's not by doing nothing and it's not by trying to cover it up. It's not by our own willpower or our strength to try to make up for it. It's not by trying harder. Now, what what does Paul say? It's through the Spirit's power. It's through the Spirit's power that we crucify or put to death the things of the flesh and that we start to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So how does that work? We got to come back next week. How's that for a cliffhanger? We're going to talk all about the Holy Spirit and how he works in our lives next week. But Paul says the only way that this is going to happen is when you step into the Spirit's power. And I don't have time to get into that today, so you got to come back next week to unpack that a little bit more. But what Paul does say is that as we start to walk in step with the Spirit, we, we can start to become unstuck and we can start to put to death the things that are actually killing us. But God does give us a couple other practical tools, a, a couple practical gifts to deal with the sinful stuff that we feel stuck in. And the first one is this, it's confession. It's confession. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul has just modeled this for us. You can look back at that in Romans 7. He he says, man, when I looked in God's perfect law and I looked in the mirror, what I saw in myself was coveting. I saw coveting. I, I actually wanted what others had and it became like a God to me. And Paul's going, man, I can't do anything to change it on my own. You know, what I want to do, I do not do. And what, 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 I, what I cannot or, or, or I can't change what I want, I can't do it on my own is what Paul's saying. I do, I do what I don't want to do and I cannot do what I want to do. That's what I'm trying to say. And I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, some of you are like me and for the longest time when a word like this would come up in church, I got pretty nervous. Anybody else feeling that? Like, oh, confession, what's he going to make us do next? Like, I get pretty nervous around this because the church, we've messed up what confession is supposed to be along the way. You know, so first I want to address what confession is not, all right? So growing up Catholic, and I, no knock on the Catholic church, no knock on like my upbringing, I, I think that they did the best that they could with what they had, but I was taught that confession was something that I went to a priest to do, and then he gave me a long list of prayers to pray or things to do to make up for my sin, all right? And, and this is what confession is not. Confession is not being told how to make up for your sin. Here's why. Because Jesus paid the price for your sin. He died on the cross once for all for it. There is actually nothing you can do to make up for the sin you commit. Only Jesus can do that. Then later in life, I remember being told that I needed to confess my sins by pastors and church leaders like me who would look around and they look out at all of you and go, hey, you all have some stuff, right? You all have some sins, but I'm never gonna tell you anything about what's going on in my life, right? You you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever experienced that? And it became pretty clear that confession was actually punishment. And that if I confess my sins, they could tell me where I was wrong and they could get me on some sort of a restoration pathway, right? So there'd be less sin for them to have to deal with in their church. Does that sound familiar to anybody? So let me be clear. Confession is not punishment and it's not what we do to make up for our sin. Instead, confession is bringing our stuff into the light. 
It's bringing it into the light and into the open so that it starts to lose its power over me. And, and so I can start to experience the healing and the grace of Jesus in this area of my life so I can start to take steps forward spiritually and become unstuck. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he puts it this way in James chapter 5, verse 16. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Yeah, given a list of stuff to do or punished? No, what's it say? What, what do you receive? Healing, right? See, the prayer of a powerful person or of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And remember, righteousness, that word is what God gives to us. When we place our faith in Jesus, we are given the rightness or the right standing of God. So if your faith is in Jesus, you are a righteous person. And when you go to someone who is a righteous person whose faith is in Jesus, it says that their prayers are powerful and effective. And when you get your sin in the open, it's not so you can be punished. It's not so you can be given a list of things to do. It's so you can be healed. And so when we confess, the purpose and intention is to come find healing, to come from a place of feeling stuck spiritually, to start taking steps forward into the life that God has for us. And when we confess, what are we supposed to, to receive back from people? Are, are they supposed to give us a list of things to do? Are, are they supposed to punish us? No. What does it say that they should do for us? Pray, right? Pray. See, it's the work of God in someone's life that brings them to confession in the first place. And if somebody comes to you and they say, man, this is what's going on in my life, you can be sure that God was working upstream to get them to that spot. And when they do, man, you have to receive that like a gift because they're trusting you. They're trusting you with one of the most broken, hurting, vulnerable parts of their life that maybe they've never told anybody about before. And they're saying, I need help in this. I need healing. And it's only by bringing it into the light spiritually that it can start to lose power. The great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he explained it this way. He said that the sin demands to have a man by himself. Sin says, keep it hidden, keep it in the darkness. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive the power of sin will become over him. He says that sin wants to remain unknown. He says it shuns the light, it hides in the darkness, and in the darkness of the unexpected, sin poisons the whole person. But here's what happens when it's brought into the light. We can receive healing. We can receive healing, right? And in order to receive healing, you got to have people around you who you trust, who, who you can talk to it about. See, James says to confess your sins to who? To, to God or to your pastor? Uh, what's he say? Confess your sins to who? Each other. Each other. Your, your community that's around you. And so our confession requires this. It requires an authentic Community, an authentic community. Uh, go ahead and hit that next slide back there. What makes an authentic community? What, what, what makes a community safe? It, it's literally the title of this series. It's a community where we are all in the same boat. It's when we're all willing to be honest and vulnerable and admit that we all have stuff that we're working through. Uh, the, the only way to have authentic community is, is to have raw honesty before God and before each other, where, where I'm working through my stuff and you're working through your stuff, and we are all working through our stuff and we are a work in progress. Now, let me say this. Not everyone needs to know everything, okay? Not everyone needs to know everything, but someone needs to know everything. Why? Because that's how you receive healing. That's how you take steps forward spiritually. See, we all need a community of friends that will push and challenge us to be better than we are right now. We all need friends around us, right? And so as people, I'm just going to speak to men for a minute. Men, we are relationally challenged, okay? If you don't believe this, like, think about what your favorite thing to do is to sit on the couch by yourself and be left alone and watch football this afternoon or something like that, right? We can be relationally challenged. So here's some criteria when it comes to authentic community. The first thing is this. Do you like them? Do you want to hang out with them? Would you watch the game with them? Would you go drink a beer with them? Would you have their family over for dinner? If you like them, that's step one, okay? That's step one. And here's the second one. Are these people who you respect so much that when they speak into your life, you'll actually listen and you'll actually act on what they tell you? Are these people that you respect so much that when they speak into your life, you will actually listen and you'll actually follow through on what they tell you? See, the reality is none of us will get through this life unscathed. 
We're, we're all going to get hit. We're all going to face things. We all have stuff that we're working through and things that come against us. In fact, the Bible tells us that until we go to see Jesus face to face or he comes for us, there are three enemies in this world that will be against us. The first one we're talking about, it's our flesh. It's our own sinful desires that are waging war against us. And, and, and then, then there's this world. The Bible tells us that the world, man, it goes against the grain of what God says is right and true and best for us. So the world that we live in, Jesus promised this, you will have trouble in this world. You will have trouble in this world. And then we have a spiritual enemy that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Satan will come at us and his mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy everything good in your life. His goal is to tell you you're not as spiritually far along as you think you are. His goal is actually to try to knock you down. And we've talked about this around here before, but he wants to try to get you to hang your identity, who you are on anything or anyone other than Jesus. Why? Because anything or anyone less than Jesus that you hang your identity on will ultimately kill you and let you down. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I was teaching on this topic of messy truth at the end of Romans 1. And um, Satan was coming really hard after my identity that weekend. I actually wasn't supposed to teach that weekend. I was tired. I taught 10 weeks in a row leading up to that. And I was actually sick. And I just wanted a break. And then I found out last minute, our guest teacher who was supposed to come in that weekend, he bailed, he couldn't make it. And to be honest with you, I knew that this message was gonna step on some toes and it was gonna require a lot of me spiritually and I just didn't have the energy. I, I'll be honest, I didn't wanna teach that weekend. And so when I found out that I was, I, I got up out of bed, I got a text early saying that he wasn't coming on Saturday and I walked into the kitchen and I started praying some things that I can't say out loud right now. And like, God, do you know what you're doing? Like, what the heck? And then I started processing it with Ashley out loud, and um, she started texting people to tell them what I was going through and what I was up against. And um, all these text messages started flowing in. People saying things like this, like, hey, Adam, we're praying for you. You got this. You are the right man to teach this message this weekend. God's going to give you everything that you need. And then Sunday morning during our setup time, when we were setting up all this stuff that's in here, Kevin Richmond and Scott Galloway, two of our guys around here, um, they literally go, Adam, stop. And they came around me and they hugged me and they started praying for me. And then we went downstairs with our volunteers where we circle up and pray every Sunday morning. And typically it's, it's me or someone else praying for you all. But Kevin goes, hey, Adam's not going to pray for us today. We're all going to pray for Adam because he's going through some stuff right now. And they came around me and all of our volunteers just like hugged me and they prayed for me as we were getting ready to step into this. And so what I got to experience in that moment, it was authentic community. It wasn't me being the pastor of this church and leading everyone else. It was this community circling up around me and going, Adam, you're going through some stuff. And it's all right, we got you. We're gonna hold you through this. And so I'm gonna kind of model for you what this moment looked like what authentic community is supposed to be. So I've got kind of a weird question for you. Um, has anyone ever wanted to push a pastor or hit a pastor? Now's your chance. Scott Johnson, you look like you would want to hit a pastor. Come on up here, man. You mind helping us out? All right, come on. Give a hand to my buddy Scott as he comes up here. I've known Scott almost longer than anyone in the room outside of just a few people, so I will let you do this for me this morning, all right, man? So come on over here, all right? All right, so here's the deal. It, stand right over here, okay. all right? And, and if, it, here's what happens. Uh, we make our relationship with Jesus just about me and Jesus quite a bit. And, and we can walk through this life alone. And, and we can go, man, I've got this. I'm hanging on to Jesus. I don't need any, anyone else. I don't need anything else. It, it's just me and Jesus. He's got me. But you know what ends up happening? We've got these enemies, right? I've got my own flesh, my own sin that will come against me. And guess what it does? It hits me. So go ahead, Scott, hit me, push me. That was better than I thought it was going to be. Normally, I have to get people to go harder. And then our, our life of faith, it goes against the grain of this world. And guess what? This world, man, it can smack you in the face if you're not watching. So, it's got a little bit harder. Push me again. I'm on my own. You got to push me. See? A little bit harder, all right? And then we've got a spiritual enemy, right? Satan, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He actually wants to knock you on your butt spiritually so that you feel like I can't get up and I can never be the person that God wants me to be. So, Satan, come on. 
Let's go. Scott, I mean, come on. Yeah, a little bit harder, right? A little bit harder. And he may hit me. Now, here's what ends up happening. I, maybe I'm not walking on my own, but men, we do this all the time. We go spiritually. I'm, I'm actually okay. It's me and God and, and it's my wife. Like, so come on up here, Ashley. We can link up to our spouses and think that, man, if we walk through this life alone, you know, with our spouse, I'm good. And men, we do this all the time, don't we? We go, man, it's just me and God and it's my spouse. She's here. She's got me. But here's what ends up happening. So my sin, yeah, my sin comes at me and go ahead and push me, Scott. Okay. A little harder. Come on. There we go. Now, what happens to Ashley in this moment? Because the Bible teaches that when we, when we enter into a relationship and marriage together, we are one. She's linked to me. So my sin lands on her, right? And then the world comes and it hits me again, right? And then Satan comes. And what if Satan comes after both of us? Give us both a pretty good push here, Scott. Come on. It might knock us both down, right? It may knock us both down. Now, you can go have a seat, Ashley. So in authentic community... We can't stand on our own when these things come at us. Instead, authentic community is when we have a circle of people around us that we come and we say, here's what's going on. Here's some stuff I got to deal with in my life. I, I got to take a look at this lust issue. I got to take a look at this anger. I got to take a look at this pride. I got to take a look at this envy. I've got to take a look at what's going on behind the scenes. And I need you to hold this stuff for me and pray for me so I can receive healing. And so I need the rest of the volunteers to come up here. Now, here's what I'm going to say. When it comes to confession and it comes to authentic community, I, I think this is true. Men, you need men. You need other men in your life that can hold you when you're getting hit. You need other men in your life that can, that can actually speak into you and know what you're going through. And women need women. I know that's not politically correct. I know that's not what our world says, but it's just true. So men, actually, I want you to circle up and link arms around me. I need one more. Uh, Kenny, you mind helping out? Sure. All right, come on, man. <laughs> So what happens in authentic community is I go, guys, I'm going through some stuff. And actually face out. I, no, I like you facing in. Stay in. Stay in. That's good. <laughs> I think this illustration is actually better. It's building as we go, right? And I'm going, guys, I'm going through some stuff. I, I've got some stuff going on. This is my own sin issue, and it's coming at me hard. And I'm confessing it to these men, and they're going, Adam, we got you. We're going to hold you. So come on. Okay. And then this world starts to come against me. The world starts to come against me because my life is rubbing the, 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 against the grain the wrong way. And then Satan may even come at me and he's going, Adam, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to destroy you. I'm going to kill you. And then all of a sudden we can start even moving back and pushing back because I'm starting to experience healing and I'm becoming unstuck from the things that I couldn't become unstuck from. And these men in my life are going, Adam, we got you spiritually. And then guess what I get to do? Guys, give it up for these guys. Thank you. Yeah, see what happens here? As we actually confess our sins to each other, what makes that circle of men safe is that we're doing that for each other. And eventually I can step out of the middle of that circle. I can join the circle with those men or women or whoever it is in your life. And you can go, who's next? Who's got stuff going on that you need to work through? So step in the middle and we're going to hold you through that. And then guess what ends up happening? We start to all start take steps towards who Jesus created us to be. And we don't have to just stay circled up looking at each other anymore. We can actually go, man, there's a lost and dying world that needs to know that there's hope for them, that there's an authentic community that they can step into and start to experience a life that's better than anything they ever imagined. And we can start to go on mission together. We can link arms and go, man, I'm going to run hard after the people that are the most vulnerable, that life is hit or their sin is hit, that, that, that Satan's coming hard after, and he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy everything good in their lives. And we can go run after them. See, Paul's going to close out Romans 7. He's going to tell us this tension that we feel. This gap that we feel between where we currently are and where we wish we were or what God wants for our lives, it's not going away. It's not going away. We, we can only lean into God's spirit in us to get there. We, we can only confess our sins to each other and pray for healing. We can only lean into the authentic community that God places around us because spiritually following Jesus is not an arrival. It's a journey. And Paul's going to say this in Romans 7, verses 24 and 25. It says, what a wretched man I am. I'm living in this tension. And so who will rescue me from this body that's subject to death? Thanks be to God. I mean, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, Jesus is the only one who's big enough and strong enough to hold all our stuff to fill in the gap from where we currently stand to where God wants us to be. It all comes back down to Jesus. The only reason, Hope City, the only reason that we're free to confess our sins, 
the only reason that we can start to live in authentic community and have the courage to do that, the only way that we can experience the Spirit's power at work in our lives is because of the work that Jesus has finished through the cross. He's the only one who fills the gap between where we currently stand and where we want to be. He's the only one who brings us into who God created us to be. And I love how God reminds us of this, every, or God, Gabe. Hey, Gabe is not God. Don't tell him I called him that. <laughs> I love how Gabe reminds us of this every time he teaches. He says, man, you're someone that Jesus died for. You are someone who Jesus died for, and it was worth it to him. And because he died for, for you, here's what's now true spiritually. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meaning this, that it's safe for you to have raw honesty before others and before God. There's no condemnation back in your direction. Just the freedom to start to become unstuck from where you currently stand and to courageously take steps into who God created you to be. But it comes through the Spirit of God working in you. It comes through confession that brings healing. And you can only get there with authentic community a body of people around you that are going to move down the path with you. And so we're going to move into our time of prayer. And, and we're going to be reminded in this time, we're going to pass communion that Jesus' body was broken, his blood was poured out to cover every sin that you and I commit, everything that you still struggle and all the tension you still feel, it's forgiven. And Jesus wants to lead you into a life of freedom. And so I've got some questions for us just to consider during this time. Where are you trying to fight a spiritual battle by your own strength? Where are you trying to fight a spiritual battle either on your own or just with physical strength? Or how about this? What's going on in your life that someone else needs to know? Not everyone needs to know everything, but someone should. Why? Because you can receive healing. You can, you can step out of that and it doesn't have to define your life anymore. Or how about this? Who's around you that's holding you in that moment? Who do you trust enough to confess it to? And who's going, man, we got you. Your sin, Satan, the world, it's not going to define your life from this point forward. We're going to hold you as long as you need us to. And then we're going to move forward together. If you don't have that, that's why this community exists. So actually fill out that connect card. Come talk to me in the back. Take a step and find that type of life. Find that type of community. And let's run down this path after Jesus together. All right? Let me pray for us. And these next few minutes are yours. Man, so God, um, man, you're really, really good. And um, I'm grateful for the example of men like Paul and um, Peter. So many others throughout scripture that, that didn't try to hide their weakness or cover up their stuff, but they actually wrote it down for us so that we could see it. And we know that we don't have to have it all together because they didn't either. And that we could see our own need, Jesus, for you to do what only you can do in our lives, to be a mirror into our lives and you've given us these gifts, man, of your spirit of people and of confession, God, so that we could start to step into who you created us to be. And God, I just pray that you would just reveal the one thing that we could do right now that would help us do that and that you would give us the confidence and courage to take steps towards that this week. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.